Bonjour, bonsoir, salut. I'm Darcy Cavanaugh. This is Linda Cavanaugh. We're wowtours.com. We want to welcome to Seven Days in Provence, France. This is one of a series of bucket list travel webinars we put together. And we've done so because we've had countless numbers of people who've asked us for advice over the years. They've looked into some research through guidebooks and done their own Google searches and that, but found that in the end, they were still had more questions than answers and they still had that sense of anxiety. We've been to all these places that we do our travel uh, webinars many times. We are very familiar with it. Our intention is to take away the anxiety and ramp up the excitement mm -hmm. by making it as easy as possible. And one of the things we like to be able to do is people have maybe one or two places that they want to go on a bucket list. And so by providing webinars, they can take a look at all the ones that we're doing and say, well, I kind of like that or I don't like that or, oh, yeah, I really like that. So we're kind of doing the comparison shopping for them uh, in a very low, costly and effective way. So uh, hopefully we'll give you some information. This is uh, France outside of uh, Europe, but this is kind of the area that is Provence, the, the yellow area. As you can see, it looks small, but it actually is a fairly large area. And so what we've done is we're just looking at this one area here. That's going to be our main focus. Avignon is our main kind of go-to um, find your bearings area. So you'll see as we're going along, we'll have some maps out. We'll always have uh, where Avignon is just so that you can kind of keep your bearings. So that said, let's uh, giddy up and get going and talk about seven days in Provence. Now, I just want to, if you haven't taken a webinar before, I just want to familiarize you with what's happening on your screen. You've probably got something like this happening if you're using a desktop or a laptop. If you don't have a full screen like that, you'll have uh, just this, uh, this arrow menu here. Just click that area and this will expand. And what this is, is just kind of your control bar. The main thing that you're really going to be interested in is this type in a question and send. So right in here where it says enter a question for staff, you just type that question in and hit send. And now do that at any time. We will be doing questions at the end, but what we find is if you've got a question, put it down, get it out of your hair, and then you can kind of concentrate on what else we're talking about. Now, if you are on a tablet, uh, there are a variety of different tablets, but it looks something like this. And the same thing here goes, if you want to ask a question, you just click on the question mark and you'll, another box will come up and you'll just type your question off and hit send. Now both when you want to end the, the webinar for the desktop, you'll go to a file and just end webinar. And over here, you'll just click this button here and click end, end webinar and off you go. Now, what we encourage you to do is just really sit back and relax and enjoy what we're going to talk about and show you the photos and, and the stories that we'll be able to tell you. Don't worry about trying to catch everything because we will be sending you uh, the video afterwards. And uh, you'll, as long as you save that link that we send you in the email, you can go back and watch this as many times as you want, especially a couple of years from now. If you're still thinking that you want to go to Provence, you'll be able to go down and take a look at that. So ready? Ready to go. Okay, let's go. These first three slides are, are ba the basics on, on people um, wanting to know how to get there and how to move around. And some of those things, those questions, uh, do not get answered by most guidebooks, right. but they cause a great deal of anxiety. So what if you've been to some of our other ones, you're going to see there's some similarity here. But bear with us because there are also some, some specifics Different things, yeah. that are unique to Provence and and nowhere else um, most people we expect will be going into the Provence area uh, through either Paris or Marseille um, some other people may for example fly from North America to the, the busiest airport you know Frankfurt Airport uh. in Europe yeah and, and Amsterdam is another one and then they'll have to transfer down you can't really fly into Avignon you can't technically but it's a really small oh, little yeah. airport Avignon is not a big town and Marseille is just down the road about an hour uh, by train, you know, 35 minutes by by car. So we anticipate that Paris and Marseille are your, your ways to go in there. But there's also something for you to consider because most of you will have to be looking at um, maybe two flights. You want to make sure that when you come into Europe that you allow for at least two at least. hours on a layover. And if you're flights. going into Frankfurt, you might want longer than that. We. 
couple of times we've gone through there and the security has been very, very high. And so we've gone through multiple security checks. So if you are going into one of these bigger airports, um, the, the airlines will tell you, oh, you're fine with an hour and a half, but folks, it's it, you either won't get there or your luggage won't get there. Overseas planes are often delayed both ways, coming back both ways. So uh, make sure that you give yourself lots of time. We've picked Avignon for a variety of reasons. Number one reason, it is a beautiful small city, very easy to get around, but it really does have a history that goes back seven to 800 years. It's a city of, of popes, and we're gonna be looking at Avignon later on throughout the course of this webinar. But it's also extremely easy to get to from Paris. You land, at the, let's say, at the Charles de Gaulle main airport, you're two hours and 40 minutes away by TGV, which is a fast train, to Avignon. Now the distance is, this will, you may find this interesting, is 660 kilometers from Paris to Avignon, and you can make it, if you catch one of the really fast ones, in two hours and 35 minutes. Yeah, it beats traveling by a car. <laughs> and so it'll just drop you right off, and you just catch at the airport, and off you go. If you go into Marseille, you can you maybe consider renting a car right from Marseille at the airport, or if you want to take the train, what you end up doing is you go into Marseille itself, and you just take it from the, uh, the train station there. If you take the TGV heading north, you're there in 30 minutes in, in Avignon, that is. And if you take the TER or the regional trains, it's just maybe an hour, but it's a little quieter, definitely cheaper, but you're there in an hour, an hour and 10 minutes. Uh, so once you're in Provence, there's uh, trains that can get you around or again, have a car rental. If you have uh, decided that you are going to drive, you might want to consider, it's not necessary, but you might want to consider an international driver's license. Also check on the insurance. Uh, I know there are some policies where you just say, well, you're parking your current vehicle and you're taking that insurance over. Just do a double check on that. We've talked to some insurance people and they said there are some clauses. So you just want to make sure that you've got that right. Lots of buses available and these buses are not like the buses in North America. These are luxury buses. Um, lots of opportunity to walk. Unfortunately, it's not very wheelchair accessible. Lots of cobblestones, lots of hills. Uh, so unfortunately, um, that could be a bit of an issue for you if you don't have an electronic uh, wheelchair. One of the things just to add on to the, to the trains is that while trains do go to Avignon and some of the other main places like Orange and places like that, it, they do not go to the small hilltop villages and towns for the obvious reason they're tied up a hill. <laughs> Um, that we're going to be spending some time. So, you know, you want to really consider car rental and, and maybe a bicycle because you're in one of the, probably the epicenter for cycling in all of France. Yeah, or a combination. You know, we've, yeah. we've talked to some people that have uh, rented a vehicle and, uh, and just rented bikes when they go there. We'll talk about that as we're going along. Or some people have brought their own bikes, although we really try to deter people from doing that. It's getting more and more complicated to take your bike overseas. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had a, a contract with Air Canada that it was cost us $60 to get our bikes over and 60 euros to get our bikes back. And when we were in the Rome airport, the uh, Air Canada person said, I don't care what you've got on paper, it's 300 euros per bike if you want to bring them back. And we had good bikes, so we had to do that. And we've tried everything. We've tried the packing them up and we put them in the plastic like they've asked and we put them in the boxes and everything. So, um, Provence is so user friendly to bikes. There are some fabulous places to rent bikes from. Um, and of course, uh, Avignon would be one of the communities yes. that would have the community bikes that you can just do take, hop on and kind of hop on and hop off on a bike. Accommodations. Well, you've got lots of choices. Uh, there are the big hotels and little ones. One of the interesting things about Provence, because it's so popular with the French, in particular in August, when it seems like the northern part of France pulls the plug and they all go on the holidays and they all come down, which is actually when the prices go up at the same time, <laughs> is that some of the hotels in these little villages, they go back three and 400 years ago, they're extraordinary. They're real boutique hotels in the finest sense of that term but they do cost a bit of money. And you might not have an elevator. That's right, most of them, no elevators. So there's B&Bs available, Airbnbs. Um, again, if you're familiar with Airbnb, make sure that you're using a super host. Home away is the same kind of concept as Airbnb. Look for those reviews before you actually make your decision to go. And before you book, 
ask him about things like, okay, if we arrive early, can we check in early? If we have to leave early or late, can we check out at that time? Uh, if, if we're early and you aren't ready for us, can we leave our luggage? Um, any kind of late night safety if, if you are arriving late at night. And sometimes because Europe is, is um, it, it's, it's so expensive for electricity and such like that, they may charge you extra for electricity, extra for cleaning, and extra for parking if you have a vehicle. Now, if you have a bicycle, not a problem. You probably can bring it right into the room. So just ask those questions before. Definitely when you're looking, you want to get as close as you can to what we call the old town, and that's that main area. You will pay a little bit more, as Darcy mm -hmm. said, but uh, these these old towns, it, they're not large areas. You'll see it. We've got the population of all the places that we're recommending. They're not large areas, so you might have to maybe park a block away or something, but the experience of being in the old town is really what you're looking for. As far as being connected with your friends and family at home, definitely need those European uh, adapters. Wi-Fi, they call it overseas, not Wi-Fi, but Wi-Fi in the hotels. Now, chances are they will either have it for free or they ask you for a daily rate. But unfortunately, that is big over there. Wi-Fi is not so big. So the, um, the hotels will maybe have one router for 300 rooms. <laughs> so the speed is going to be very slow. If you are staying at a, a b and or an Airbnb, a home away, again, just ask if they've got that wireless uh, Wi-Fi. Pubs and restaurants, as you probably know, they're open, not very good for doing secure banking, things like that. SIM cards, you can buy SIM cards at the airports. You just want to make sure that you read the small prints. You can buy SIM cards online. Um, you can ask your local service provider, Rogers, tell us any of those ones. And they, they now have uh, where they'll charge you a certain amount to, to take your, your smartphone overseas. So again, just do all that checking before. If you're looking for buying a SIM card and getting it to ship over, you probably need to give yourself a month to get it purchased overseas and, and shipped all the way over. Restaurants and cafes. Well, Paris is considered a great place to eat, and I'm going to tell you right now that Provence is equally a yeah, special spot. More relaxed. It gets way more relaxed. Yeah. And because they have a very temperate climate, it's very pleasant from early spring to late uh, autumn, and sometimes during the winter, the result is that the cafes and restaurants, you can sit outside more days in than you have to be sitting inside, and it's just great. Uh, the mm -hmm. food is fresh. They, they really, really make a big deal in Provence about food. Um, a few little words if you're staying at a B&B &B or a hotel. Breakfasts in, in France tend to be, and Provence is, is in this category as well, small. No you know, bacon they, and eggs. No bacon <laughs> and eggs. You're going to get a croissant, uh, a coffee or a couple of coffees. If you're really lucky, maybe a little yogurt and a little bit of food. Lunch is a big meal of the day. Um, and then in the afternoon, you may want to consider if you come from North America where we eat earlier, you may want to look at a, at a place where it serves tapas, or if you've got a, an Airbnb apartment, maybe you, you have a little snack in your own place. Because the French don't start eating supper at the cafes and the restaurants until 8, and we joke about it that they actually don't seem to turn the ovens yeah. on until 9. But that's okay. Because they want it laid back. Yeah, it's very laid back. Now, tipping, as I see that we've got some people on um, this webinar that we're on our, our Paris one. Thank you. Appreciate you coming back. Um, tipping is a little bit different in uh, Provence as it is in Paris, because in Paris, we talked about how you just really round it up to the next 24, 9, 25 to 25. Um, but here in Provence, if you're paying by a credit card, make sure that you leave a cash tip. And sometimes during the day, it's maybe one or two euros. In the evening, maybe five or 10 percent. So you see that's a little bit more than what we talked about in Provence. And the reason for that is much, many of these restaurants are family run restaurants. So they aren't, um, the, the serving staff are not as professional as the Paris uh, servers. Grocery stores, they're very small. They'll be like your corner grocery store. But bring your own bags because Paris is very alert to the plastic issue that we have in the world. But they've got all kinds of really interesting things, and you can always go to a bakery if you're oh, really absolutely. hungry. Loves I love bakeries. One thing about the bakeries, and, and you were talking about the money, is that um, over here we have a tendency when we get change to sort of put it aside. Yeah. You want to keep your change over there because a lot of the restaurants, cafes, bakeries, and grocery stores, they actually will ask you, do you have the precise change? And it's really handy to have it. 
And they're great to have at a bakery because if you go early in the morning when they're fresh, and it's always fresh at a French bakery, and it's always, always French in a Provencal bakery, is that you just give them some coin and they're going to love you for the day. Bakeries are great. There's no calories. I've been told year after year <laughs> after year. Every single baker said not dreams. a single calorie. Uh, very inexpensive. It's just fantastic. <laughs> love them. Lots and lots of market days, and you'll see some pictures of the market days. Uh, this is where you can buy all kinds of interesting things. Trinkets to expensive scarves and tops and linen tops uh, and truffles. But oh, truffles. you might want to be careful with those. Truffles are um, basically a mushroom. And S stinky mushroom. They really smell. And the better the stink, the, the, the higher <laughs> the, the uh, caliber of, the, of the, uh, the truffle. And they actually have pigs and dogs that are trained to, you know, go and get them. Now, the truffle's main season seems to be in spring. So if you're there in summer at one of these food uh, markets, and, and the, the food that you'll see at these markets is astonishing. Yeah. It's just fabulous. But if you go to a, one of the truffle places and they say, oh, you've got a summer truffle, yeah, that's when your little antenna should go up and say, no, I don't think so, and because that's not the season. And sometimes what they'll do is they will weight a truffle. Put some lead in them. Because the truffle has what the same value as the same size hunk of gold. That's how expensive and, yeah. and valued these yeah. are. So the heavier they are, the more you're going to have to pay. Beware. So beware of those truffles. And I'd say if you're really wanting some truffles, go to an actual storefront rather than the markets yeah. for the truffles. Preferred beverages, well, you if you read my introduction, I said I'm hoping that you're drinking some rosé wine. That's um, my drink of preference. Darcy's is pastis. Now, pastis, you'll see down here, it's a licorice drink, and I'll just swirl it around here. It's a little bit on the yellowy side or gold. You can see through it. Now, you can see it, and it's about to turn white, milky white. Now, this is a, oh, I like this drink. This is a very high-powered um, licorice drink that the that the Provencal person will will actually love to do. And I'm, i got to taste it now. <laughs> oh, right. Salute. Sorry, cheers. Boy, oh boy. It was a call of the pasties. So cheers to you. I hope you're having a sip of, of whatever your favorite beverage mm. is. And they do have coffee and pop and such like that. But, you know, with Coke, you'll pay probably more for Coke than you will for yeah. pasties and the rosé. And one of the things about the rosé is that they do have all kinds of wine domains uh, in the area. And a domain is where they, um, the house of where they're, they're having their vineyard. You can just be driving down a, a secondary road. We we did it with cycling. We'd find all these secondary roads, and we'd just go cycle and explore the area. And you'd see a, a little sign that said tasting, and you'd just go in, and they'll give you a, a sip of the wine, and you'll visit with the, the people that own it. And if you want, you can buy a, a bottle of wine. Um, we did that several times uh, the last time that we were there. And you want to share how much that wine cost? We went into one of the places, and, and tastings uh, in French is degustation, degustation. So we went in and and I chatted with them and they, we really liked the wine. So the fellow, I asked how much it cost. He said, five euros. And I thought five euros for a you know, nice glass. Well, that's yeah, okay. Yeah, so, it was a hefty, it was, I'd say the, t the taster oh, yeah, was about that yeah. size. And he said, no, no, that's for the whole bottle. I said, the whole bottle? <laughs> he said, yes, the whole bottle. And so he brought out a full 750 milliliter bottle of, of this beautiful wine and we took a sip of it, five euros, and it's one of the finest rosé wines I've ever had. Yeah. And uh, we, too, and our friends, were th we went back, I think, three times <laughs> and stocked up. We we're almost becoming relatives. We we're showing up so yeah. often at this yeah. domain. Um, but they're very appreciative because, yes. again, that's straight uh, profit to them. They don't have to. Uh, Europeans like to see if there's a way that we get around the tax man. So uh, that's straight cash to them. Uh, so whatever your beverage is, you'll be able to find it there. Safety, um, much safer than in Paris, although in Avignon, we'll talk about when the festival is on, that's probably where you're going to run into the pickpockets, but for the most part, uh, it's, it's fairly safe. Just use your common sense. We use money belts, and although we've had people laugh at us because it goes around your tummy, I put it around the back so it doesn't look like I've got a great big belly, but the fact of the matter is we've seen so many people in all the years that we've been traveling where somebody has stolen their wallet or they've dropped their wallet or and just in the excitement of, of getting this and picking that up and you put your purse down, you forget it there and off you go and then it's gone. So 
just be alert and um, we'd recommend money belts just be, to put your definitely put your passport and your very important papers in but you don't want to be digging into your your money belt all day so what you should do at the start of your day is maybe have a little purse or something like that and you put in the money that you're going to think you're going to need for that day and you just put it in your pocket or wherever it is so that you don't have to dig around and show everybody not just your, your tummy, belly, your yeah. tummy <laughs> but where all your valuables are you, you bring this out and you can pay throughout the course of the day this does a couple things. One, it safeguards, you know, your 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 real valuables. And if anybody or you lose your your little money clip or or your little money purse, if you lose it or it gets pinched by somebody, you know, pickpocket like Linda's talking about, all you're losing is a little bit of money, nothing that's going to drive you around the bend. So good good piece of advice there. Our last newsletter we sent out, we talked about the things that you need to protect and got a lot of comments back from people saying I was just thinking it was like our passport that we need to protect but there's a whole bunch of other things that you should be doing with those really important papers because boy with the the, the challenge that they're having with people coming across borders and that they're very very diligent on security courtesies well when in France try to speak a little French if, if you don't know any French Right now, you you know, by the time you leave, you should still have a few of the basic phrases such as bonjour madame, bonjour mademoiselle, s'il vous plaît, which is please, merci, thank you, and, and a few of the other ones. It doesn't take much, but it shows yeah. that you are being polite. Um, and, and in, you know, in Paris, they can be a little bit, you know, edgy about the, the accent. And My accent doesn't work I, for I'm, I massacre the language. Yeah. And they can kind of look at me a little strange, but in Provence, it's different. It's, because, it's quite different. Yeah, yeah, they're much more laid back and yeah. uh, much more forgiving. Bathroom, that's always an important area for Absolutely. me to be watching for. But now in these smaller areas, they'll usually have some sort of facility in the middle of the town square, whether that's one of the ones where you put a euro in or uh, whether it's one of the ones where you um, it, it's free. Uh, just keep in mind that these um, go in, do your business, wash your hands, get out, because uh, after a certain period of time, a machine comes and sprays blue soap all around and washes it all out. So <laughs> you don't want to get caught in That'll there. That make you that. a member of the Blue Man group. Yeah. The blue the person smurfs, group. Eh? Um, but in the cafes, you can use their washrooms, but you should be buying something. So even if it's a coffee or a croissant, just uh, you have to buy something to be able to use the facilities. Weather. Uh, when's the best time to go to Provence? Uh, for me, it's it's all 365 days of the year. Having, however, people may not be quite as in love with it as we are, but from summer, from early uh, spring, right through summer uh, until mid late October, boy, you can run into some very pleasant weather. This is sort of dry. This is not a rainy area. This is you. It, if you go there and some of the pictures that we will be focusing on, you'll see, boy, it does look dry, and it does get dry. And that's dry is important for the wine. <laughs> They, they need the soil yeah. to be really dry and clay. Yeah. One of the other things on, on the list here, you'll see a word called Mistral, and that is a serious <laughs> piece of wind that comes all the way from Siberia over the Alps and then pummels Provence every once in a while. It's very much, if, you, if people know southern Alberta from here, they will know about the Chinook. In, um, down in Texas, it's a Santa Fe winds. Japan has a version of it. In Spain, it's a Tremonante, and they can be pulverized. Now, uh, one thing about having such a nice climate in Provence, you can stay outside late and you can have almost all your meals outside. You don't need a lot of clothes. And that's what we encourage you to dress for comfort <clears throat> rather than style because when it's really hot, it's muggy heat. And uh, and so, you know, at that point, you probably don't care what you look like. Um, linen is very big over over in Europe. And the reason linen is big is because it breathes so nice. So there's lots of places called... Uh, the white shop and the blanc shop and they you can buy linen from there very good quality linen but it it breathes and it washes really good so just be comfortable is really what you're wanting to do for women I always encourage you to take a scarf with you because then in the evening if you're out and it's like 11 o'clock and it's starting to get maybe minus 17 <laughs> plus 17, plus 17. <laughs> plus, sorry plus I'm, I'm into the minus mindset right now we're in the heart of winter um, but if it's plus 17, you might actually, because it's been 35, it might feel a little cool on your shoulders, so a scarf will work. So seven days in Provence. Finally, we're here with that. Thanks for bearing one. But that, those, those basics are really important for anybody that's never been overseas. 
we don't want you to be exhausted. We don't like that Chevy Chase concept where you're running around looking at things and not getting any any relaxing. So we started our days at nine o'clock in the morning, gives you a little bit of chance to sleep in, finish by 6.30 in the afternoon, and that's time for you to just embrace every area you go to. And that's planning for driving, that's planning for cycling, that's planning for breaks in the morning, lunch and mid-afternoon. And then you can go back to your accommodations, kind of relax a little bit, get cleaned up, and then get ready to think about supper around 8 o'clock. Um, we anticipate that most of you will be traveling by car, a rental car that is, or by bicycle. Um, and we would encourage you to go on as many secondary roads as possible. Mm -hmm. France actually has an excellent system of secondary roads. Now that you will see A roads, which are the you know the, the toll roads, those are fast. Everybody's driving crazy. Like and, the autobahn. Oh, absolutely. And, and then and for national roads is very much the, the same. Mm -hmm. What you really want to look for are the D roads. Um, and the D roads are really quiet. Uh, that's where the locals go. Now. A D road will often have one number after it, like a D number three, and that just identifies the road, much similar to what we have in Canada and the United States. But you will sometimes see a D and two or three numbers after, like D213. The more numbers after the D, the quieter the road will be. And you, there's all kinds of interesting things that you'll see on the road. You know, I have to go around uh, cows or around goats, or but but. And, and that's where you'll see a lot of the domains too. So that's where you can really get into the heart of Provence and see what it's like to actually live there. We've put together um, our seven days in Provence without you having to go vast distances. That's not what we want. We want short, maybe half hour, 40 minute drives. We, no one route from point A to point B is longer than 80 kilometers, and most of them are half that length. Yeah, so if you're on a bike, then you might want to say, okay, I'm going to break that that day into another day and go go to 40 and then the 40 and then go off onto the, the next route. So you'll see as we go along, we've given you all the mileages so you can be able to figure it out. If you are on a bicycle, then um, you might want to adapt, but it's just really the one that's the longest day for the bicycle. The, the others are definitely attainable. Uphill sometimes, but attainable. <laughs> Um, and again, you know, we put them in day one, day two, day three, day four, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's how you have to go in those days. You might find that the weather is not so great one day and you decide that you're going to go another another route. Um, again, you'll see as we go along, the maps are very self-explanatory for you. So we really do want you to experience Provence because it is marvelous. When I win that lotto, I'll take you with you. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. And uh, we're, we're going to buy a place in Provence because uh, I would just love to to spend a year in Provence like Peter Mail. We're starting in Avignon because it's easily accessible from Paris, it's easily accessible from Marseille, but it is a beautiful city on its own right. It has a ancient wall that's 4.3 kilometers, it goes all the way around, there's one of the gates. Inside the old town, buildings going back centuries, including the Palace of Popes, because there were popes here who were in competition, so did religious competition with those in Rome. <laughs> um, so that it's a wonderful city. Now, we're coming back later on and you'll yeah. have more time there. So what we're gonna recommend is that when you get into Avignon, whether you come in by car or you take come in by train, there are TGV stations on a little bit on the outskirts uh, of, of the city uh, because the trains are bigger and faster, but the, the older TER trains, it takes Avignon. you right in. So what we're gonna suggest, get your place in advance, drop your luggage off, just walk around and enjoy it. Find out where the banks are so that you make sure that your bank card will, will function. They'll, they'll have a little screen there about all the, the you know, the yeah, cards that will take. Yeah, do a double check on the bank to make sure that your bank card will be accepted in Europe. They're getting better and better every year, but there still are some banks that are only European cards will work in them. But I mean, look at this place. Can, can uh, you not see yourself sitting mm -hmm. in one of these? You just got off the plane, you're kind of tired, and you just sit down there and you just relax and you add a, a order a beverage and a, a nice uh, tapa and you just sit and watch what's happening. This is a festival. We'll talk to you a little bit more about this, but this happens once a year. And uh, as you can see, wall-to-wall -wall people, but all kinds of very interesting things. That's the Festival de Avignon, and that goes on in July for almost three weeks. If you're planning or considering going on to Provence in July, consider booking yeah. well in advance if you do want to go to Avignon. This is a party. This is a blast. Yeah. 
So day two, we call it the famous painters and beautiful water wheels. Again, this is your frame of reference. Avignon is there. We're starting in Avignon and we're going to these places here. So you can see not a big amount of distance here. So we leave Avignon and we go to Saint-Rémy-de-Provence. Small little town, but boy, is it ever absolutely. It, yeah. Who else loves it? Princess Diana loved it so much she bought a mm. house there. Princess Carolina Monaco lived I there for several that. years. Yeah. Vincent van Gogh loved it so much that he actually used one of the cafes as an inspiration for one of the most famous paintings he ever did, Starry Night. Starry Night. And actually, when he was there, he did himself some damage and checked himself into the mental institution, mm -hmm. which is still there. Um, it's a wonderful town. You just park on the outside and you just go around and around, walking the, the little alleys and this stuff. You'll, you'll actually see in the bottom center is a little fountain. That's Nostradamus's fountain. He was the, the French who, at the Italian heritage, who was a seer of all things. <laughs> He's pretty good, but fabulous place, two to three hours, and you're going to be enchanted at the end of that. Um, pottery is huge in Provence, so you'll see the bright yellows and reds and greens and everything like that. But they have, um, St. Remy has a fabulous market. So it's a population of 10,000, and it, it probably comes close to doubling when they have market days because every street is blocked off because they've got vendors in it. So here's an example. You can buy some mustard mm. truffles on it. Darcy loves mustard and he loves truffles. So it was a given that we were buying that. Um, take a look at this paella dish. <laughs> this is an example of what you can buy to eat at that time. Um, strawberries, fresh. The white asparagus, I am not kidding, is about that big. And think about the asparagus that we buy here, about that thick. White asparagus is about four times that and fresh and marvelous. So St. Uh, Remy is such a great place to be. All kinds of interesting knick-knack places to walk around, interesting little corridors. It's a lovely place. So you jump back in the car or on your bike. Uh, if, if you're in a car, it's about a five-minute drive to Les Baux de Provence. And that's it on the top hand right, which is basically, it's an ancient village. It goes back. Uh, somewhere in the area of eight centuries, there's castle ruins. Some of them are pretty good shape. Um, it's a small town, 400 people. Yeah, it's a good hump up the hills. Uh, oh, you can see here, like boom, on a bike. Boom, yeah. Boom, yeah. You can't park in the town itself, so they have designated parking spaces uh, at the bottom of that that slant that Linda just showed you. Um, but boy, this is really worthwhile and invariably makes the list of one of the most beautiful villages in France, which is actual competition with celebrated yeah. travel writers and, and television hosts. And it's sort of like the Oscars. And the Oscar for the most beautiful village in southern France goes to Saint Le Beau de Provence. Yes. Runner-up is Saint, Saint Rami de Provence. Great place to go. And now and a half, two hours, we have a couple of pictures at the bottom left. And those are paintings. Yeah, lots of artists you'll see um, get up. You can see the view. So they can get up there and they'll paint and just the architecture of the the um, castle is, is spectacular. Now, if you are cycling, you will be rewarded because you can park your bike right up there and everybody else is going to hoofing it up there. And by the time they get up there, you'll have finished doing all your sweating from that steepness. And it's downhill after that. Yes, marvelous. <laughs> well, from there, we're going to our the end of day destination, Lille sur la Sorgue. Um, this is my favorite town in all of France. Uh, 20,000 people it serves as a market center. It serves as sort of a, an agri center for the entire area. It's quite flat around that area. But it's also right at the top of the list for those who like antiques. They have antique yes. uh, shows and, that are just amazing. And the town itself, the inner town is like an antique itself with buildings that go back six, seven, eight, uh, you know, hundred years. You have the river that goes around it. There's, there's me on the bottom, and and you just cafes and wagon wheels, wagon wheels, water wheels <laughs> that are side by side, and wow, it's yeah. a wonderful place to, to to use as a base and just to visit on its own. So if we win that lottery, I'm gonna buy a place here too. So yeah, Saint Remy and so yeah, yeah, because I love I love this area too, and and again, very peaceful. Lots of places to sit and just watch the action, and there is action. Obviously, there is action on the river. So day three, again, just to give you your bearings, Avignon's way, seems like it's way over here. It's not that far, uh, but we're starting here, and you can see we're going to make a nice little circle there, and not too much. So if you're on a bike, this is uh, not a big effort for you to do in the course of a day. 
We're starting off in Lille sur la Sorgue, and we're, we're actually going to come back as well. These villages that we're going to recommend you visit are unique. Every one is different from the others. The first stop we're going to suggest is uh, Fontaine de Vaucluse, and it's a small little community, and it's right against a series of cliffs. And from those cliffs, which go basically 250 meters above the town site, there's a big spring water pond. It's, it's more like a small lake. And Jacques Cousteau almost died there. And I've always thought he was there on a dive. And that if it had gone wrong, we would be looking at this and saying, this is where you know the world's greatest underwater explorer passed away. Okay. The town itself is wonderful. Um, schools bring busloads of kids up there just to, to get a sense of the history, as you can see from the ruins on the bottom left where Linda's on her bike. And uh, there's a paper mill museum. But just to drink in just how wonderful this, this place has been is and probably will be for a long, long time. And so you can see, uh, again, very user friendly for bikes and bikes can go along here. People can walk along here. We encourage you to have a bell if you go, if you are going to some of these places, just so you, if it is busy, you can alert people. But they're, they're very friendly with bikes and they're very accepting of bikes. So this is probably where you could buy some trinkets. There is a white shop there. I bought some outfits there. I think you bought yeah, a shirt I did too. there. I did. Yeah, so there is a white shop there, but also you can buy souvenir type trinkets, but probably not a lot of really good quality clothing except for the, the Blanc shop. We go about a seven or eight minute drive south of there and you go to Gord, which is probably the preeminent hilltop village well, in the no, entire yeah. country. It's extremely well known, which means that consequently, a lot of tour buses will stop there. So if you go to visit here and we encourage it, be prepared that you're going to be, you know, side by side with a lot of people, especially if you go from late June, you know, to, to through August. Um, it is it is stunning. It offers the great views, as you can see. Um, artists have been going there for hundreds of years, inspired by the beauty that you can see from the, from the top of the village. And and the sense of whereas Fontaine feels sort of cloistered against and protected by this these series of cliffs, this one sits on a promontory alone, and it's like We've got control of everything, <laughs> and that's what makes this particular village that's so That's why unique. it lasted, because you could see all the bad people coming yeah. to try to... Run away, uh, run away. Yeah. So a couple hours there, you can see um, we rode our bikes up there. I love to ride my bikes in these little communities. You can see the cobblestone, so it's tough if you're on a road bike, because uh, the, the, the tires are quite narrow. But uh, I like to just cut through these little places and just kind of see what's happening in those areas. So um, great view it once you get up to the top eventually. Lots of places to just sit in the shade and relax. And you'll be very appreciative of that, that shade of those trees when it's uh, plus 40. Next is Roussillon, the, the red village or okra. Um, and that's what makes this unique because it's got a color scheme yeah. on all the buildings. There's no other building uh, or excuse me, any other town or village in all of this area, the, the Luberon. Of, um, of Provence that looks like it. And so it's worth it just for that alone. Park your court at the bottom, you know, with most of the other people to sort of walk up, wander around an hour and a half, lots of shops and cafes. You can drive right into it, unlike some of the other towns, but be, be prepared that it may, it may be a struggle to find a parking, parking space. Spot. And if you're there in the, in the heat of summer, there's gonna be a lot of people around, but definitely worth, a, you know, an hour, an hour and a half visit. Um, just lovely. If you are renting a vehicle, you've got to be alert to how people in France drive. And it's they, they'll get into a parking spot and to get out, they'll bump, 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 bump until they get out because people will park so close because parking is so hard to find. So um, that's why if you are renting a vehicle, you might want to park further away so that you don't get any of those little scratches on your bumper. Salads are quite different in Provence compared to, in all of France, compared to what we have a salad here. You see there's very little lettuce in this, uh, but lots, there's that asparagus that you can see. Obviously, you know that I like asparagus, but um, very fresh, everything's fresh and fabulous and um, uh, marvelous food. Minerve uh, is, an, is another village unique on its own. This is where the uh, uh, retired British advertising executive Peter Mayle decided he and his wife they would retire so they came here they lived in this village and he wrote a book called A Year in Provence which became an international bestseller he wrote a bunch of subsequent books detailing their ventures it became an internationally popular TV series with Lindsay Duncan and John Thaw uh, we watch it every year 
Yeah. It's just great. Um, the 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 influx of of tourists right after the book <laughs> has sort of drifted away. So it's very calm. This very quiet, right. polite, yeah. sweet, beautiful little town is probably the way it was a couple hundred years ago. So it it, it really captures the essence of Provence. Uh, traditional lifestyle more than most communities. So an hour and a half, two hours here. Joe. And then on that, we're starting to head back a bit, and this is uh, Au Pède Le Vieux. There are actually two Au Pède Le Vieux. Uh, there's a new one, and uh, that's okay. That's okay. But go to the old one, Au Pède Le Vieux, which is actually quite small, and and where three people constitute a major you know <laughs> crowd. Uh, there's a church and some castle ruins up the top of the hill. Artists go here. It's really quite nice. Uh, it's a really pleasant escape. If you there's a little square there where you can have a drink or lunch, and it's, it's really and of course really lavender is everywhere. Lavender. And whenever we see the lavender, Darcy always pulls some off, puts it in his handlebar bag, and smells it as we cycle through Provence. It beats the smell of sweat. <laughs> About an hour, one to hour, one and a half hours uh, planned to be here. On just before we leave Opel Le Vieux. On the way back, our next main stop, of course, is Vaison en Romaine, but there's a little town called Robillon, and it's sort of halfway between the two. If you want to take a little detour, okay. you can go into They have a, a lovely old church, an old square with some some sculptures of some of the uh, the community's most uh, noted uh, historical figures. It's a nice little break. But really, where we're going now is Vaison en Romaine. Yeah, so day four, uh, we call it the Giant of Provence and the Roman Ruins. And just to give you a feel, we're a little bit further away from Avignon now, and we're going coming from Sorg, and we're going into Vaison. So we left Sorg, we stayed there last night, and now we're heading out to Vaison en Romain. So first thing in the morning, just yeah, have your breakfast and head head north. And the nice thing about it is it's a short drive. There's lots of different roads you can go, um, but if you do start to get a bit lost, you just have to look for a giant mountain in the backdrop, and that's Mont Ventoux, because it's almost you know, it shadows Il Solo Sorg. Uh, so you can see lots and lots of, hey, I recognize yeah. this picture because Darcy wrote, uh, if you aren't familiar, Darcy wrote some murder mystery books and uh, this is your second book. A vintage end. So this kind of um, picture is on the front cover of it. Uh, but enough of that. Um, shiny objects, I get distracted. This is uh, lots of flea markets, lots of markets. Again, here's where you can go to a domain, buy some wine. They have these Roman ruins that are spectacular. This is an amphitheater. And as you know, Darcy's a singer. I stood, this is me way up here. Darcy's down there and he sang and I could hear him like I was standing right next to him. So it still works. So you'd like to spend some time here. But you're not, you don't want to spend it when yeah. you get there. When you leave Il Solosorg in the morning, you drive here, we would recommend that you find your spot close to the old town as possible, drop off your stuff, and then make the next step. Yeah, you'll come back. And it's Mont Ventoux. Mont Ventoux <laughs> is the giant of Provence. It's got the best views of anywhere, Look without doubt, yeah, in Provence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All it, the way up to there. It's also a hard. mecca for cyclists, and they come from around the world to do this. And when the Tour de France comes here, and it usually three or four years, it's usually the toughest stage of the entire race, which is usually three weeks, and you can get a minimum of half a million people on the roadside cheering. So you can see how this is close up. You can see how they wind their way up. This is Darcy. We now have fold up bikes, which are much easier to manage uh, overseas because they fold up and go into a Samsonite suitcase. So um, still they're very powerful on the gears. They've got all the gears that a regular bike would have. So here's Darcy. He was uh, heading up um, Mount Bantu on his bike. So. We encourage you to go up this, whether you're biking, uh, if you want to uh, rent a bike, you, there's places that in Vaison that you can rent a bike, really good quality bikes. Um, but if you're driving up, one of the things I encourage you to do is, they usually have um, vehicles in France and they're standard vehicles. So I want you to just think about going up these really steep hills. And if you're not familiar with the standard, <laughs> you might have some problems stalling out. So make sure that you're comfortable in shifting gears and everything before you even attempt this. But you've got to be alert because there's lots and lots of cyclists on this road. One thing, instead of coming back the same way to Molossin, which is a lovely little town that's right at the west side of it, we would recommend that when you go to the top, go up the, the, the down the other side. It takes you to a little town of 3,500 called Bedouin. And that's, it gives you a different view of, of Provence from way up high. 
And all it does is add maybe another 10 or 12 kilometers. And when you're leaving from Bedouin to go back to Vaison La Romaine, it's a lovely view. It's, excuse me, a lovely drive with great views. Yeah, two, three hours there. There's nothing at the top. So you're just driving it up and, and watching all the cyclists sweat. And there's all kinds of interesting cyclists, I'll tell you that. On the way back to uh, Vaison, uh, there's a little town called Entrechaux. And a small little town, and if you want to stop, it's just sort of a three minute pull off. You just drive off and just shortly before you hit Vaison. What's really nice about it is it, it's at the base of sort of the northwest side of Ventoux. And unlike a lot of parts of uh, Provence, which look really dry and are indeed dry, yes. this area's got lots and lots of trees. And uh, so it's, it's, it's got some castle rooms at the top. So it's a nice little break for, you know, maybe half an hour or something. You can see how dry that soil is on this picture here. And this is, again, this is apparently that's exactly yeah. what the, the wine wine trees need. So about 30 minutes. Yeah. Right yeah. And you're back into uh, Baison Romain, 6,000. What a beautiful town this is. It is it's yeah. got a, a wonderful uh, medieval town. Uh, it, the, the ruins, the Roman ruins and that, you can easily spend two hours just there. Um, they're about, uh, I'm just going to take a guess here, they're about four or five city blocks. Linda showed you the amphitheater before. Main town, great, great places. Yeah, and you'll see these little restaurants just kind of snuggle over into a corner here and a corner here. This is the main area, and when they have their market day, oh. which is 450 odd stalls, this is just jammed with people. Mussels are huge in Provence, and they'll make them all kinds of different, like curry mushrooms and chili mush uh, mushrooms. Did I say mushroom? You said chili. I meant mussels. Yeah, mussels. I only had two sips. <laughs> so uh, mussels, lots and lots of mussels there and all kinds of different flavors. So this is a, a place where you can really just relax and, and, and enjoy the, the evening. So now we're at day five. We call it Knights and Romans. Uh, here's our go-to area. And you can see we've kind of moved over here and Avignon's here. So we're going to start in Vaison, and you can see we're going to go to two communities that are just touching each other and over to here. So very, again, a little bit of a length shot here, but doable. The drive down to these two communities, Tarascon and Bocaire, is the longest of the entire trip that we're recommending. It's only 80K, though, and it's on a flat road with good D-roads, so half an hour to 40 minutes. Um, the, the two towns are the same size by within a couple of hundred people mm -hmm. and they straddle the Rhone River. They both have castles, um, so you can stop here and we really recommend just take a little detour and visit, if, you want to, if you're a castle person, you may want to spend three or four hours and visit both, but if there's one castle to visit in this trip, if there's one castle to visit in southern France, this is it. It's the one in Tarascon and it's, it's like it was designed by the best castle person <laughs> architect <laughs> centuries ago is beautifully restored and wow what a great place uh, and that's Linda and I on the bottom in the center over and you can see that you know the view it just, how high you yeah, are yeah absolutely yeah. um not a lot of shopping here there's some souvenir shops and such like that but I wouldn't you know if you if you're looking at doing some major shopping to bring back clothing and stuff like that then probably your best bet is to wait for Avignon and who's that woman? Is that you? That's me, yeah. yeah. So you see, all the way down is this area here. So to get across from one side to the other, you've got to either go all the way down or hoof your bike on your shoulder and walk it over. Lots of places to go. We took a picture of this because we actually, uh, one of the times that we were there, we followed the tour because uh, we were there in June. The tour was coming through in July, so they had it all set up. And so we followed that route, and that's one of the times that they went to Mount Bantu. Lots of places to sit and just relax and enjoy yourself here. So plan for two or three hours. If you're really a castle freak, you might want to wait. This is, I think, takes you down to the jail. You might want to go down mm. to the dungeons. Uh, so if you are castle people, like Darcy said, you'd love to. to and it's a nice there. break. The Tarascon one, right across the street from it, are several yeah. cafes. So you can sit out there and have a coffee or a glass of wine, whatever you want, and just sit there for half an hour. And, and this thing it will stare you in the face, and, you, and, and that will tell you that you are not anywhere else but in Provence. It's an Instagram moment. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. So from there, it's just a quick 20-minute John, 15-minute John down to the city of Arles, or Arles for, uh, English speakers. And it, it, this is a world UNESCO site because its downtown corridor goes back 2,000 years ago. 
one of the places that indicates it, and you can see it on the bottom right, is the amphitheater or the arena where they have today still have concerts. They also have bull fights, and like yeah, you know, and the bulls do not end well in this place. But Arles is a wonderful place. You're staying overnight. Wow, and and those little lanes that you love so much, sweetie. Wow, you can just walk lots and lots and lots. It is a gateway so that to the Camarage, so where you'll see the pink flamingos, the white horses, the uh, salt, the it marshes. It's just fabulous place to, to spend a lot of time in. And you're going to stay overnight here. So um, again, there are a few specialty shops, mainly souvenir shops, but boy, I'll tell you, they're loaded with restaurants. And again, if you're a cyclist, there's lots of little sh shootout trips that you can uh, go, uh, like a hub and spoke kind of. So day six, two bridges not too far. You're going to freak when you see one of these bridges. I can guarantee that. Here's our area that we're at. We're coming from Arles. We're going to Pont de Garde and then back to Avignon. And you're going to love this. The, the drive to Pont de Garde is 20 minutes. Uh, you can stop on the way if you want. But Pont de Garde is, for me, uh, one of the three most stunning, can't believe I'm there, sites in Europe in no particular order. Eiffel Tower, that thing is that big? The Roman Colosseum, I can't believe they built that 2,000 years ago. And this one, which is a three-deck, three-tier uh, aqueduct that the um, that the Romans yeah, built year. And when, when you, you pull up into it, um, and we recommend, you know, earlier the better, because this place gets literally Very millions good, yeah. of people over the year, it's, it will take your breath away. So they'll only let you cycle and walk across here. They won't let you on these other uh, two tiers. But you can see how big a space it is. And you really, the magnitude, you've got to think about how many slaves died in the building of this thing. But it, it's just a massive building. This is a great place that you would maybe pick up a picnic lunch. There is a caf cafeteria kind of thing there in the souvenir shop. But pack a picnic lunch from Arles and a bottle of wine or some nice um, uh, juice or something like that and just go and have a nice little picnic. There's all kinds of action along here, lots of kayaking and lots of boats. So this is a great place to spend at least three hours there. Um, but it's very, very peaceful. Make sure you don't miss it. If you're in Provence, you yeah, do not want to yeah, miss yeah, this. For sure. And from there, it's just a short little ride back to Avignon. And the beauty of it is now you have more time because you're probably back in Avignon noon, very early afternoon. And now it's your time to really explore one of, one of France's great small cities. Now, they, they do have what we call the community bikes. Uh, we're starting to see more of them in Canada and some of the bigger cities in the United States. But in Europe, almost all of the large communities have community bikes. So you'll see they look like this. Depends on the type of bike as to whether you just buy from a station like this. And it's fairly easy to read. Most of them have an English version that you can read. If not, you can get the app for this, and it gives you lots of information on that. So you can just cruise around. Or you might want to take a, a daytime bike tour. It takes about two to four hours, and they're self-guided. And they will take you all the way through Avignon. Of course, this is a time that maybe you might want to start doing some of that shopping. Lavender is huge, smells marvelous. It's very relaxing to put in your steamers at night to help you sleep. The, um, I mean, who would not love that, a purse like that? If you brought a, somebody a gift back like that, no one else would have something like this. In, um, you, you probably have the rotisserie chickens in the supermarkets in Canada, the United States. They are just, they can't hold a candle to the flavor of the ones in Provence. And the reason that they're so much better in Provence is the herbs that they use. So you can buy these in the markets, but what we encourage you to do is maybe buy them from a storefront because, you know, again, you won't know until you get home exactly whether that are the, the herbs of Provence or not, or whether it's just some seeds of something. So this is a great place to shop. Um, and, but it also has, again, it has the, the Palace of the Popes, it has the Petit Palais, and it has countless other old buildings. But the one place, the one antiquity that shows up <laughs> virtually every single time on photos of Avignon is this bridge, Pont saint bernard which was one time went right across the river. Uh, not so much anymore. They chopped it in half, but it's still great. It's, it's a great views, and it has a museum um, right at the door. And it, as well as the city being, a, you know, you know 
UNESCO site. Um, this, it, it, this bridge alone carries that designation, which tells you how big a deal that is. An hour and a half, two hours um, at, the, at the bridge and museum, and then you're back, walk around. Avignon is a great city for walking around. Yeah, yeah. And, and great to have your last supper there. <laughs> yeah, the, well, it is but a it city is of your last, yeah, it's, yeah, it's your last supper for the trip anyways. Uh, it's time to go. Well, the next slide we'll deal with if you go back to Paris, but we're going to think that maybe what you did was you, you came to Avignon by way of Marseille. Um, which is a very short drive or train ride. If, you, if you're driving, you may not want to drive to Marseille, in which case you probably just want to pick up your car and drop it off in Marseille. Um, but along the way, you get a choice, and it's to go to a town called Aix-en-Provence. Now, so if I won that lottery, mm -hmm. I'd buy a Another house here, house too. Here. Yeah. Yeah, so that's too. like four, you know. Yeah, we're counting. Yeah. It's a, it's a city, university town, 140,000 people, known for its fountains, and the fact that Paul Cezanne, the great uh, painter, lived here virtually his entire life and painted it hundreds and hundreds of times. But now we're, let's say, whether you go there or not, you're on your way to Marseille. Marseille is uh, France's second biggest city. Uh, we have a few little pieces of advice there. One is to recognize that it's a pretty rough and tumble, and it has been worse, but it's pretty rough and tumble. So be careful where you stay, you, the closer you are to the old port, the probably the safer you are. And, and the more expensive, too. Yeah, but, but, but safety is safety. And the, and the inner harbor, the old port, is, is just beautiful. It's yeah. It's got restaurants all the way around. You can go out to Fort Saint-Jean, which is, is a great uh, fort. There's a museum beside them, uh, which is a European and Mediterranean civilization museum. Very funky, very, but if you sit there, even if you don't go in, sit there and you'll see a little island off to the side there, and you look at that island, you say, that looks familiar, maybe. And it was Alexander Dumas' setting for the Count of Monte Cristo. That's where he was supposed ah. to spend his time. But the thing is, if you if you're there for a time and if you like seafood, you have to try the bouillabaisse. bouillabaisse. Yeah, and they um, everyone in Paris uh, or in Provence says that they make authentic bouillabaisse. But the reality is, there's only a few that actually do. It's like the French baguettes. Not everybody can make a baguette proper way. So they have these little crests on the menu and they will display them. And so if you're going to spend the money for a bouillie base and they're fabulous and they aren't short on seafood, you make sure that you get one with the crest on it. So now you're maybe heading back from Avignon back to Paris, whether that's going just quickly through Marseille or however you're getting to Paris. Um, you want to think about when your plane is, uh, is leaving. So do you have to get out early in the morning at Avignon or can you stay for a little bit? All of those you want to think about. But you can grab the afternoon train at TGV and it'll take you maybe two, three hours to go. We always say to people, go first class because... Second class sucks. <laughs> so this is, this is first class. This is a rarity that you see this quiet, but this is how nice these these trains are but first class is nicer than second class and you've got to be alert especially if you're traveling on a saturday in europe it's busy travel so if you've got lots of luggage <laughs> you want to be in first class so that you've definitely got the room to be able to put your luggage and you store your luggage up here um, you want to reserve those seats so too if right, you're on yeah. tv especially during the hot times and one further the the uh, rail workers I have a tendency if they're going to have a strike, and they do it more than they more do, than yeah. every blue moon, that they're almost invariably going to pick what day of the week? Saturday, yeah. because it will cause the greatest inconvenience. Yeah. So, so get some sense of it by the local news or asking around. Even if you don't speak French, there'll be an English. And sometimes they'll journalism. have these re revolving strikes. Yeah, right? just so, on they go. Yeah, and they just kind of go from one area to another area to another area. So you just again, you you need. To Talk to the locals about um, the trains, just yeah. in case you're in case you're running into one of this. If you do get to the Paris airport and you are staying overnight, uh, Ibis doesn't pay us money to say this, but <laughs> this is the we stayed at the Four Seasons. We stayed at some of the other places for crazy expensive for a night. Uh, the Ibis is very nice. It's not like your regular Ibis, which is. Uh, it's, the rooms are fairly nice, and uh, you can, if you want, 14 euros for an hour if you just need to go in and shower and whatever. So that's it. That's, it. that's your seven days in Provence. Can you not just see yourself there? So we've got a couple of questions. Um, 
maybe what I'll do is I'm going to read the questions here and I'll get you to start sure. answering them. The questions I've got here over on the other screen is a little teeny type, so it, uh, I'm going to have to bend forward here. If you have a question, folks, remember, go in, type in, um, just hit that little arrow. It's going to expand your question and then uh, type it in and hit the send button. So, uh, Kathy. If we decide to go through Montreal, should we go to Paris or Marseille? Mm, good. That's a good yeah. question. I think probably both are acceptable. It, it depends if you want to add Paris. Uh, personally, I think a, a two-week vacation that takes in Provence and Paris uh, would be a classic bucket list trip for you. Um, takes in the most Although, beautiful city. We've got we've got another one coming That's up right. uh, on the French Riviera. And so if you could if you can manage three, three weeks, weeks, that would be that would be yeah. marvelous. Yeah, would just you take, you will yeah. want to go and live in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I would tend to if I was Montreal, if I'm going to Provence and that's going to be the essence or the center of my trip, I want to go to Marseille. Because from Marseille, train station or from the airport, you're an hour away from Avignon and the start of your Provence holiday. So you might also, we're starting to see, they used to do it a long time, then they stopped doing it, now the planes are back doing it again, it's called Open Jaws. And so that means you could fly into uh, Paris and fly out of Marseille or fly yeah. into Paris and fly out of Nice or uh, two different areas. And so uh, again, depending on what you're, where you're going before or after, you might wanna look at that Open Jaws. And really there's no additional cost for that. Or, or there haven't been the last few times that we've booked it. Uh, Tim, what is the mood of the people in Provence? I heard that Paris is stuffy. Are they more laid back? Yeah, they are Absolutely. considerably. Yeah, and yeah, we've heard that um, people say that that uh, people in in Paris are stuffy. It's not necessarily that they're stuffy. It's just that they're very conservative. And so, you know, if you're struggling with something, they aren't going to just come over and help you like we do as Canadians. But if you ask for help, they'll help you. But they don't want to intrude. So for some people, and, and there are some people in, in, in Paris that are a bit stuffy, but um, per, Provence is very much more laid back, more relaxed. And uh, again, you're going to run into some of these places where you're going and it's their family run businesses. About the only time it does get a little on the, um, we haven't got much time is in, in August, August yeah. yeah, and yeah. because they're just overwhelmed. The Parisians all come down to the south, uh, so it, it gets quite busy in August. Uh, Samantha, can I can I pull a lavender plant and take it back home and try to grow it? Yeah, yeah, I don't think so. I think they might throw you in jail, Samantha. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, you know how they always ask you, have you been on a farm? So this is where you want to say, no, I didn't pull out that lavender plant. But you can buy, again, all the way around. You can buy them in the, the markets, but I, again, encourage you to buy them from the storefront or even in the airport where you can buy lavender seeds and stuff like that. Um, you can buy the packs that you put under your pillow. Lavender is very good for helping with sleep. So yeah, I'd, I'd be very careful about doing something like that. Chrissy, can you combine cycling and a vehicle? I think, yeah. Provence is ideal for that way because mm -hmm. all the places we've told you about, if we take away the hilltop towns, it's, it's fairly flat. And and because none of the communities are far from each other, it's easy to access them by bicycle. Um, so that's why you will see it every single day. If you're there from early spring to late, uh, late autumn, you're going to see a lot of cyclists, all kinds of them, young, old, tandems and all that. So it's really great from there. And even the smaller stores, excuse me, the smallest villages and towns seem to have a really quality um, bike. bike shop. Yeah. Um, driving, very simple. It's just yeah. uh, be alert. You're not driving along. Could you put the two of them together? Absolutely. Yeah, it really depends on how much you want to cycle, really. And yeah. Again, this trip, you can do the whole yeah. cycling. It's just that one day that's a little bit longer. Um, but uh, we are seeing more and more e-bikes. And for those hilltops, <laughs> an e-bike -bike might be nice. Uh, you still get your workout because um, you're still having to, to pedal and everything. It's just if you get to your limit, you just flip that switch and it helps you just recover a little bit. So, um, yeah, it's, it would be a great, great trip to combine the two. Uh, Tara, is it safe to eat the food at markets regarding that big paella dish? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, okay, Darcy. I'm going to let Darcy tell you his story because... When we we were in Vaison La Romaine, and uh, you know, I think the best the best market town of anywhere in France, which means bringing back memories. Yeah, it's bringing back. So 
the, the good thing with paella is that paella, you have to stir it to keep it going. I love paella. I eat it three times a week. I make it. I've got all kinds of paella uh, pans and this stuff. So that's not what to worry about. It's the stuff that's been sitting out there, maybe some of the sausages, and I should say the soft cheese. Um, the soft cheese has been out there four to six hours. I I bought some soft cheese. We were out with the friends and came back, and boy, did it ever taste good. Until about 10 o'clock that night when all of a sudden the cheese decided, whoa, we said, whoa we're going to pay that man from Canada. We're going to pay him a visit. The next day, I had to ride Mont Ventoux with my friends. So I rode Mont Ventoux. And I have to tell you, it was a heck of an achievement, and particularly since I left so much of myself on the roadside, thanks to cheese. So I, you know, they, be alert. They say that heating and cold will kill whatever bugs might be in there. Um, but I think this cheese, the rest of us had a little bit of cheese, but Darcy just loved that cheese and ate lots Bad of it. Bad decision. And um, so, yeah, uh, we had refrigerated and everything, but yeah, uh, so. It wasn't pretty. Yeah, <laughs> so pay attention to what it is that you're buying. And and like we said, if, it, if it's kept cold, then get it back in and into the fridge and, and chill it and, and then look at, at eating it. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, Gary, what is the nightlife? like in Provence. Pretty quiet. I mean, uh, it, outside it, Avignon, it, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sorg, you saw know, Sorg and Vaison Romano, the two of the bigger communities, and they're pretty they're pretty quiet. Um, and Arles, those, maybe. Yeah. Arles would be a, certainly a, a bigger one, serving as sort of the entrance to the Camarag and that and it's a bigger town. Um, so you can look around in advance, particularly in Avignon, and find out what concerts and things are going on. They may have, you know, some nightclubs. They do have some nightclubs there that go on. But for the most part, most of the places that we've recommended you visit, <laughs> nightlife isn't it. But what they do instead of having the standard nightlife, you know, partying and all that other stuff, is that people go to the restaurants, the cafes, and they will start at 8 or 8.30, and it's an evening. It, none of this, you know, fast food attitude or got to eat, got to eat and get out of Dodge. What they do, it's a whole evening. So people will be there until 11 o'clock at night <laughs> chit-chatting at visiting and that's nightlife in places like Sorg or Vaison at Saint Rémy. You know Vaison probably um, they in the summertime they'll have maybe uh, concerts that they'll play in the Roman ruins or mm -hmm. they might do uh, little plays or things like that but they'll be all more local where it's all family oriented so they'll be over uh, yeah. at, at a decent hour. We're not heavy party animals there so you know, if we uh, we've been cycling all day, so if we can make it till 11, that's that's probably a that's with a nap to get to 11. Us, yeah, but this you know, Darcy comments about the suppers, and that's one of the things that you probably find if you haven't been to Europe is the biggest surprise to you, is that a meal is to be enjoyed, and a meal is to be shared with conversation with friends, and so you will always have to ask them for the bill because they will never bring the bill to you, and in some places. If you're just sitting and having a coffee, that coffee might be expensive, but they're expensive, expecting you to stay there for at least an hour. So um, this is where you have to just relax and just really enjoy the food and the atmosphere that you're in. If this is a bucket list and you might not get back to one of these places ever again, you want to absorb everything you can pull into that and just experience it. Frank, I don't like wine and I don't, I think I like that pasties. I, I'm, Frank, I don't know how you can survive without wine, but or pasties, anyways, yeah. yeah, Frank, yeah, Frank. <laughs> um, he says, "Can I get good beer?" Mm. Oh wow, yeah. Darcy's really more of a beer man than anything else. But 30 years ago, 40 years ago, when I first was in France, um, quality beer was was just not to be had. Experience. They had beers that were generic, but like many parts of the Western world, in the last 10. 12 years, there's been an explosion of craft breweries, micro breweries. And the consequence is that Provence has jumped on board and there are lots of these small little breweries in Provence that make beer that you're not going to get anywhere else outside of Provence. And so, Frank, you're going to be happy. If you're a beer person and you go to Provence, you are not going to be disappointed. Pricing, though, I mean, rosé, oh, yeah. you know, we can get a half a carafe of rosé for like three euros and it's good rosé and it's probably from that area. Um, but um, the beer will be a little bit more expensive. Or double, double that for a pint. Yeah. Um, so again, folks, if you've got any more questions, we're getting kind of close to our um, uh, wind-up time. Wanda, how safe is Provence? 
I think I think Provence is as a rural area where there's lots of people going, you know, from June through the end of August is extremely safe. Um, I think it's safe year round. Um, the the French are very aware of uh, making sure that the tourism trade remains healthy and strong, in particular in Provence. I think it's very good. And if you're a, a woman traveling on your own, I think for the most part, there's a guy saying it, but I think common sense, you're going to be fine. Yeah, I think, you know, maybe during the festival, you might need to be a little bit alert, but yeah. Especially if you're hanging out at 3 in the morning. But, it, you know, if at 11 o'clock on the festival, as we well know, yeah. on a festival evening, you're out there with thousands of other people. You're, you're, you're safe. You're yeah. safe. Um, Tim, um, I had a friend that came back and he brought honey lavender. Mm. Or, yeah, sorry, yeah, honey lavender. Yeah. Um, is that from Provence area? Yes, it is. Actually, we bought some honey. Yeah, we did, there, and yeah. um, boy, it was smooth. I'm not sure I've ever tasted. I couldn't figure out how you make honey with lavender, and and it was interesting. You may recall that where we bought it was in one of those little places near Saint Remy, the Provence. Just had a sign that said honey. Yeah, so we and we went, and it was a Spanish woman, you know, and so we ended up jabbering away in Spanish and this stuff, and she had a whole room with all kinds of honey. And there are other, you know, um, honey producers in Provence, and they'll invite you in and you can sample. And she had all kinds of samples. So we walked off with our friends, and I'm pretty sure that we walked off with 60 or 70 year olds of honey. We had a lot. Fabulous. Oh, and and she also good. said that you can put it on, oh, this is, and I'm glad there are no calories involved in this, ice cream. You can put it on ice cream. And I thought, oh, God is good to us. <laughs> when he doesn't put it or you know any calories it's just great um sorry i was just thinking about that honey that um there are so many places that you can go and they're just on the side of the road that they ask you to come mm -hmm. in and, and again it's very safe to go in there and see them brian is the food expensive a lot of those little hotels that we we mentioned earlier you know that are they're very boutique they're they're extremely well appointed uh, they're very fancy. They're in buildings uh, they're, that are four, five, six hundred years old. They're not cheap. The consequence of that is to make sure that the people who come and stay there are totally satisfied with a really first class uh, experience is that they, they bring in some of the best chefs in France. And some of those little places have Michelin star, um, you know, stars hanging on the wall. And that tells you, you know, the credibility is this is great. Having said that, and you pay, can pay a lot of euros for a meal there. Eating in Provence, excluding maybe parts of, of August, is it can be very inexpensive and you can get great meals, big big portions by French standards, big portions, and it's so fresh because fresh, yeah. yeah, the water, you know, the sea is just down the road at very short distance. Everybody seems to be growing vegetables. Wow, it's the shrimp a, and the mussels and yeah. if you're a foodie, Provence is where you want to go. Um, Donaires have made their way mm. into uh, France, so pretty well every small community you're going to go to, they're going to be a dinner place. And um, again, I don't eat meat, but Darcy does, but they make great French fries. So you can have a very inexpensive meal uh, at a dinner place too. So depends what you're looking for. Pizza is everywhere and their pizza is quite different than it is here. It's kind of like the old Tom's pizza if you can go back that far. Uh, so it's thin crust. Um, they'll have oil that you put on it, very little cheese on it, and um, but exceptionally good. Uh, so I think that that's all the questions we've got. Any last minute questions, folks? No? Okay, so thank you for coming. We've, um, as you can see on here, we've got uh, Barcelona. This um, picture here is Barcelona. Uh, that's on March 6th. Uh, April 9th, we're doing seven days in Scotland. And then following that, the following month, we're doing Scotland's Western Isles, visiting whiskey distilleries. We've been there often. Uh, we do like uh, really good quality single malt whiskey. So uh, we're going to talk to you a little bit about the, and instead of the rosé, we'll probably have some snifters of uh, whiskey to kind of just talk about the texture of that whiskey. In the fall, we've got two in, in, on the Spain Mediterranean coast. It's just because it's so large that we just couldn't do seven days on that. So we've broken that up. French Riviera, Danube, that's where we're really going to talk a lot about cycling. Netherlands and Belgium. So, folks, you will get our newsletter. We'll have another one coming up, I think, in another week or so. So uh, any questions you've got, 
you know how to get a hold of us tomorrow i will be sending you a link with the uh, recorded webinar just keep that link and then you can continue to watch it and watch it they will be live for probably at least six months so cheers thank cheers. you and enjoy provence mm.